Good morning, everyone. This morning, I'm joined by Professor Maurice Jackson, an associate professor here at Georgetown in our history department, in our African American studies department, and an affiliated professor in music. Maurice, I wish to thank you for your leadership over many years in our work to deepen and expand our commitment to racial justice, to building our partnerships and collaborations across the District of Columbia, everything that you do for our students and for this community. I want to thank you for taking the time to be with us for this conversation. And first, welcome back. You're returning to Washington after spending a year teaching at our GUQ campus in Education City. Can you talk about your experiences in Doha and what it's like teaching our undergraduates at GUQ? Well, I'm back and, and, and uh, you know, as I, as I told you before, I think my wife wanted to stay. We had a delightful time there. You know, growing up as I did in the South and growing up, um, you know, in the projects and, and, and in poverty and going to a place like Doha, which extends its reach to, to young people all over the world, from Uzbekistan uh, to Kazakhstan, uh, many places I've visited over time, from India, from Pakistan, from Bangladesh, all over Africa, Sudan, Somalia, Ethiopia. The, the opportunity to teach young people from places like that is, is really one of the high points of my, uh, 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 of my, of my life, to work with uh, young people whose minds are unfiltered, uh, uh, who, 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 who just want to learn and want to learn about other things and want to learn about other experiences. And I taught a class there of all things on the Harlem Renaissance, on the ideas of new ideas opening up at the terms of literary and social ideas. And the students were just wonderful. I, uh, and the experience is led by uh, uh, Dean uh, Ahmad uh, 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 Dalal, who's a, a historian of, uh, of Arab science and uh, just a wonderful experience. And to have a chance to travel, my wife was with me. We traveled to several countries. And then as they call it, Miss, uh, Miss COVID hit. So when she hit, we had to stay home. Now, uh, you've been working on an important new book. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, it's getting importantly long, so I'm <laughs> trying to come to an end. You know, there have been a lot of books written on, 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 on Washington and more and some, some good, but what I wanted to do was look at it differently. I wanted to look at the people of Washington, D.C. in an international context, but I wanted to look at, at the struggles they've had uh, to exist over time. So we start off with... Uh, the fight against slavery, but telling stories of unique individuals like Yarrow Mahmoud, who lived right down on Dent Place uh, 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 in, 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 in Georgetown, and many people and how they struggled uh, 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 for freedom. We tell the story of, 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 of mainly of, of women. I, I'm, I'm, I decided to write about Georgetown and slavery last because I wanted to end. And so I'm looking at it and, and uh, telling the story of Edmondson, who was the last uh, uh, slave there are telling the stories about the struggles of African Americans during the Reconstruction. It's very interesting that, uh, that what I found in, in, in writing this is that I had thought of one time of, you know, the next project to deal with the, with the many ways that African Americans have fought for freedom, socially, politically, economically. But then I find that in using DC, I can do that in two. For example, uh, we talk a little bit about sports, but how African Americans have used sports, philosophy, social clubs, uh, uh, I tell the story. My favorite story is a man of a man named Sylvester Duckett. Sylvester Duckett was a 15-year-old kid who was uh, who uh, who lived all over Washington, like the great novelist Edward Jones, and decided uh, in December of 1918 that he wanted to go and fight for democracy. And so he lied about his age, went up to New York, and uh, joined the uh, 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 the Harlem Regiment. And uh, and uh, on the year after he left, he died at the Battle of Argonne. And he brought back and he's buried in Arlington Cemetery, but this young man who fought for democracy. We don't hear about people like this. So I have a, a ton of stories uh, of, of, of men. And of course, of, of, of other people who we know about, uh, people like uh, 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 Mrs. Mary Church Terrell and people like that, uh, or, uh, or uh, I tell a story of Lou Stovall, who was a great artist up the street. I'm talking about a guy named uh, John Wilson, who, you, who both, uh, we both know. And the beauty of telling the story by John Wilson is that I'm able to look at the youth movement and, and, and actually show how this uh, a student nonviolent coordinating committee trained so many people. Marion Barry came out of it, but many others uh, came out of it too. And how they use these organizational skills. So there's just many stories that I'm uh, uh, trying to tell. How close are you? Well, 
I uh, I'm editing now, and uh, I have to edit uh, one more chapter, and then I have to write the summary. The problem is, <laughs> I hate to say this, but it's not much interesting that happened in Washington since Marion Burr died, and 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 there are many stories. We've had three or four mayors, but uh, the movement of the people, of people fighting for 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 structure, and people fighting for uh, rights and for rent control and all those things. So uh, uh, right now I'm trying to figure out how to summarize without going into a lot about the last four mayors because quite, quite frankly, when you write about things that don't interest you that much, you lose the, uh, the flair. Now why Marion Berry uh, was because uh, uh, he and I had major, major differences around certain things. But in looking back, uh, I really do see a man who, who has some innovative ideas about the city and about businesses and about things like that. We haven't had that so far. The last thing he did was uh, create this Commission of African American Affairs. That was his last act. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I'm trying to uh, to look at that. You know, we had a control board. We had all those things going on. But there's not been a struggle uh, of amongst African Americans and others to retain those uh, uh, and refrain from all the, the things that it forced people out. So I want to figure out that. So a couple of months, I'll have that off and edit. And hopefully it'll be come out in a year, a year or so. And I can get my life back and my, you know, <laughs> wife will not be able to fuss at me about having a, a messy upstairs floor. <laughs> now, you, you mentioned the DC Commission on African American Affairs. You served as the chair of the commission, and your commission was responsible for a series of reports focusing on different aspects of African American life in Washington, documenting and researching evidence of racial disparities in our city. One of these reports focused on health disparities, another on housing, education, and economic inequalities. You know, as we look at the impact of COVID-19 and its disproportionate impact on black communities, what should we be paying more attention to and addressing more closely in this moment? Well, well thank you. So you, you're exactly right. There were two reports. Uh, one report we did with the uh, School of Nursing led by uh, uh, Dr. Christopher King, who's been on your program, and did a wonderful job. And uh, he reissued in the other report that I did the lead on, on housing and economics. What we find is that there's no separation. That, uh, uh, for example, uh, we knew that big gaps within uh, the African American and white community on issues like uh, cancer rates, life mortality, infant mortality. Uh, a black man lives 12 years shorter than a, a, a white woman, and all those things. We know the reasons uh, why. But now when we look at this pandemic, we are able to look at it closely because it ties in directly with the condi economic conditions of people. I'll give an example. If you look at Ward 2 and Ward 3, the levels are way, way down. If you look, and I live in Ward 4, which is where uh, the quote unquote black elite had lived uh, uh, before, then people like me moved up and the elite left. Uh, but I'm here now, it's a nice neighborhood. Uh, but three or four blocks away, a lot of apartment buildings. And in apartment buildings, the, and so in this ward, it's the highest rate of COVID cases in the city. And a lot of it is because people live in apartments, in, in apartments complex. Now the city, uh, 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 they had a case down at the Woodner, which is down at 16th and Spring uh, Place. And they had a big outbreak in that. And the city commissioner said something like, well, we are responsible for dealing with people in homes. In apartments, we are not so concerned. Well, it was the exact wrong way to do it because when people live in close proximity, and then you have, of course, uh, when people are poor, you could have two and three households living together. It's just, it, 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 is, it is natural. And often, so you have uh, this, and then you have uh, transient communities and others. So in certain levels, especially in, 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 in Upper Columbia Heights, places like that, the rates are off the map, and then in Anacostia and places like that. And these places directly correlate with people who have poor uh, 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 rates of, of, of medical care, but also uh, uh, large indices of uh, cancer and things like that. Yeah, yeah. You know, and i tell you one other thing. I, <laughs> I just happened to pick up the Boston Globe yesterday. I don't know, I was reading, I was overseas. And it said the average wealth of a black family is six dollars now what they meant was that wealth is, is what you have over what you owe now the average white income uh, accumulated wealth is about four hundred thousand dollars the average black in dc is about 190 dollars and so you have those big gaps between what one actually owns 
as opposed to what one has. And so you can have, a, and so you have people who live in apartments who, who, who have no inherited wealth. Then you're seeing something new in Washington. I, it didn't, I didn't realize when the report came out. When the report came out, you had the tendency for poor people to try to stay in the city. They could, and what you had was, was wealthier blacks or better off blacks moving to the suburbs, Prince George's County. Why? Because they could buy a piece of land and, and then the schools. Now we see gentrification is just so all encompassing that those areas around 14th Street and others where they've been projects, they are forced out and then put in these big condominiums. So then a study comes out and says, well, the rate between black and white is decreasing. Well, it's not. You are forcing the poor people out and even middle class and other blacks to come in. So it is, and, and let me just say this, and, and I think you know the audience should understand this. Often when people are dealing with African-Americans and, and even in, in, in academe, and when people deal with economics of poor people, people don't view it as 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 as, as valid studies. Somehow it be, it's, it's less valid. It's not interdisciplinary, and it's hogwash. And so, therefore, the struggles. If I were writing a report on, and I've been in many countries in the world, if I were writing on, on a report on on on, on a, a poor country in a quote unquote third world. I'd be a hero. Why? Because I'm dealing with uh, exotic people or something. But see, black people aren't viewed like that. We're viewed as just commodities. And even some people at the university view it like that. And so therefore, with the study, uh, 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 it wasn't appreciated enough. And I'm just grateful that your office gave me the support that I could go off and do the study. Because as you know, the city appoints you to do something, but it gives you no help at all. None. Nada. And so we had to do it in, in the support of, 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 of your office allowed me to do a study which has been duplicated many, many times over the city and, and the nation. Yeah. Now, um, let me just shift a little bit. As you know, over these past few days, we've been reflecting on the legacy of John Thompson Jr. and the way that John's life has impacted so many of, of us in our community. I heard you on the Kojo Nandi show, and I think you said something along the lines, when I think of John Thompson, I think of two words. I think of dignity and righteousness, and he had both of those. Can, you ask, can I ask you about Coach Thompson and what you see as some of the most important aspects of what he contributed and maybe a little bit about what he means to the city of Washington? Yeah, thank you. You know, I knew the great poet Sterling Brown, and uh, he was once at a memorial, and he got up and said, now I want a quote from the great black poet. And then he said, Shakespeare. And what he was doing, because Shakespeare had written about decolonization, things like that. So I want to quote from the great uh, black poet Shakespeare. He had a line, oh, brave new world that has such people in it. And it could have been written for, uh, 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 I called him uh, uh, Mr. Big John, uh, for Mr. Big John, because uh, he was, we use the term one of a kind or, 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 or uh, bigger than life. And, for, and we use it too often. But in this case, it is exactly uh, uh, true. He's a man made of a special mold. Now, the beauty of Mr. Thompson was that, uh, unlike so many people who we cherish in Washington, he was not from the upper 10. He was not a blue veiner, as they say. He was a man whose father was a, a tiler. His mother was a domestic worker. Uh, they worked hard every day so uh, uh, for he and his sister uh, 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 to have a decent life. Uh, sent him off to uh, sacrifice, sent him off to, to Carroll. High school, and uh, and uh, but before he did that, he found out uh, 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 one thing. He said that he had loved baseball, but he was he had the size of basketball. So he started playing, and he went and he played at these segregated uh, played at these segregated uh, uh, places. Number two boys club. Now that didn't mean they were they were dangerous or anything. That they just were segregated, as all life was uh, then, pretty much now too. So. Uh, and well, number two boys club, and then at 1425 W Street uh, at number 13. And he played at all these uh, places, and then he went to uh, Carroll and, 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 and played basketball and succeeded. It's 11th grade grade year, All-American. And then uh, played with uh, the, uh, Monk Malloy, who became the uh, president of, uh, of, of, of Notre Dame. And then uh, he'd come up, and in the weekends, they'd go in over the Chevy Chase Circle, and the Chevy Chase, very, very segregated. And Mr. Thompson tells the story they played there. Now, where the playground was, <laughs> they put a, a school library up because they didn't want the black people there. But he went, and uh, then of course off to uh, uh, to Providence and 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 and, and a different life. Uh, it, there's so many stories. Uh, Lou Kaneseki, uh, 
wants him to go to uh, St. John's and he calls uh, 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 his mother. And she said, I can't send my boy to New York. And, and, and Lou says, he's 16, he'll make it. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but he went to Providence and, and excelled. And, and you know, I'd read about this story where he lived with, the, uh, with a, 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 a family, the, a Faresh family. And he tells the story about with this Jewish family he lived with in Boston and Providence and learning of life from them. And when I think of that, I think of Louis Armstrong who was different than Mr. Thompson because Louis Armstrong was born in Auckland, Auckland, but who in New Orleans was taken in by this Jewish family. And he had learned therefore a lot about different things of life. So John Thompson was a big, but I say that because people often say angry black men and things like that. And Thompson just had a great appreciation for life uh, and for people uh, in general. And, and, and I was reading today, Dean Smith, when Dean Smith said uh, about him, he's the finest man I've ever met. And then I thought about what Mr. Uh, Thompson said about, uh, about Jabo Kenner, who he brought there, uh, a, a most Christ-like man. So see, this man is learning from everybody he's been a part of, just learning, learning, learning. Oh, he taught, but he's always absorbing. Yeah, no, thank you, thank you. So a few you, years back, you published a volume with, with Blair Rubel, DC Jazz, telling an extraordinary story of the history of jazz music in Washington. Can you give us a sense of why it was so important for you to have a book focused on jazz in D.C.? Well, what I try to do, uh, President Joy, is, 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 is tell stories through mediums and tell stories to, to things. So in this book I'm working on now, stories to sports. Hear stories to uh, music because people have been, people have, I've heard people say music will free you. Music won't free anybody. It won't do it, but it will give you a bomb in Gilead. It will soothe the soul. And in Washington, music soothed the soul and had many people who led it. And, 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 and uh, this one man, uh, kind of James Reese Europe, who, who went to Dunbar High School and studied uh, sometimes with John Philip Sousa, uh, became the great uh, bland legend uh, in Washington. He and another uh, man named Will uh, Marion Cook, who had gone to Oberlin, studied classical music, but who went to Oberlin and was supported by Frederick Douglass. So you have all these things. So Will, so uh, James Reese Europe uh, is in Washington. Now, the thing about Washington, and it's true of any anything, if you want to make it, you got to leave the city, at least in music. You don't have to do it as much now. But in the old days, if you want to make it, you had to leave. So he left and went to New York. But in the meantime, he also went and fought in World War I and became and won a medal, the, the, uh, the Croix de Guerre, and then brought this music back to America. As he's playing in France, uh, he's playing this this music and the French looking at him they, this way, that way. Then all of a sudden they realize he's playing the French uh, 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 Marseillaise. And jazz stays there forever and he brings it, but when he brings it back here and the soldiers march up Fifth Avenue, New York, black soldiers aren't allowed. And then it's the story of Duke Ellington, uh, Washington's uh, 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 greatest, who, by the way, went to Armstrong High School and not done by where many others went. And it's the story of Buck Hill. Buck Hill, who I've just worked with, uh, and they put a big monument, a big uh, a picture of him up at uh, 19, 18th and uh, U Street. It's the story of Shirley Horn, who was the great black woman who, was, who had decided to stay home. And then Miles Davis hear her playing uh, uh, one day. So it's the story of many, many people. And many people now, what happens now, all the great musicians do not have to leave and go to New York as they used to. Now, if you want to make it big time, you got to go to New York. But many now are coming back and contributing. Yeah, that reminds me, uh, over, you've led our effort over the years to partner with Jason Moran, the extraordinary jazz pianist. And can you talk a little bit about Jason's work and how you see contemporary jazz music? Well, um, I should say that one reason we brought uh, uh, Jason Moran is the conversation I had with you. You know, we just, we, we talked one day and you said you wanted to bring in some innovative, not that Georgetown doesn't have innovative people, we want to bring some other innovative people. And you said, give me 10 names, I'm gonna ask 10 other people. So I say to you, no, I'll give you one name because if the other 10 other, that's 100 names that I'll never get to. So, and, and Jason Moran and I, you remember we came over one, th one, uh, one a homecoming day and had breakfast and, and we brought him in as artist in residence. And he is one of the great creative uh, musicians who uses music both as a social platform, but as a creative endeavor. And he, and, and he uh, plays with artists. Not long ago, he was up at the National Cathedral and he did a thing with uh, Glasswork and at the Kennedy Center. And he and his wife have done a concert dedicated to uh, 
to the burnings uh, in, 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 in Tulsa. He played here in a dedication to Martin Luther King. So a very creative young man who was, uh, who was uh, 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 using music and art and all those things to, to spread. And then, of course, when he comes to Washington, uh, he comes in and, and does a residence at Georgetown, but he also hits all the other clubs. And there he meets so many other people. And there's some, some young guys coming out of D.C. and some young ladies to D.C. who are coming out. Alan Johnson up at UDC. UDC is producing some great people. Uh, Elijah Barbet, a tenor saxophone man out of this world. Uh, ben Williams, uh, who, who plays uh, nationally. Uh, come off tour with, with Pat Metheny. Corcoran Hope with Kenny Gertz. So there are many, many local musicians now who are just, they're going to New York, but they're also coming uh, back home. We want to do more and more things, you know, at, at, uh, at Georgetown. Well, thank you. Again, as I said earlier, welcome home. It's great to have you back in the city back on campus. Um, in closing, is there one, one message you'd like to leave with our community as we start this new fall semester? Yeah, well, I think this is mainly to, uh, 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 to the students. Uh, you know, it's, it's, I have them, I have uh, two classes and a couple of tutorials. And I say to them, uh, it's gonna get better. You know, I've seen a lot of things, all of us have seen, I haven't even seen anything like this, but I've seen a, a lot of things. And uh, we have science on, uh, on, on, on our side and hopefully we'll have uh, better stay out of politics, but hopefully we'll have uh, <laughs> logic on our side. And so, it, 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 you know, things will get better. And just to uh, tell the students, uh, treat the parents good, cook them a meal every now and then, take a walk, don't get fat, and study. And now you just have the chance there to study. I tell my, you know, my colleagues, ease up, you know, have the students work, but it's not a time to let them know how much we know, what the time is to let them bring it to us. And as, uh, as the great uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar says, you don't go to college to learn what to think, learn how to think. Now is a good time we can teach students how to think using uh, mainly, in my case, primary documents. So uh, I have students from all over the country and I'm having a ball uh, 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 with them. They, they haven't seen anybody quite like me. I'm, uh, you know, <laughs> but they have to read, they have to learn and, they, uh, and they're doing great. Well, thank you, thank you. And thanks, thanks for everything you do for our community. Thanks for everything you mean to this place. And thanks for taking the time to be with, with us this morning and joining me in this conversation. And I look forward to being with all of you again soon. Take care of yourselves and take care of everyone around you for everyone, everywhere. <laughs>